All right. Hey, friends, welcome to Theology Automatic for the People, TAP for short. And this is our last TAP class on Essentials of the Faith, which is a class that we started, um, gosh, seven, eight weeks ago, which I don't know about you all, but even just saying that, that feels like an eternity ago. And so if you're just joining us for the first time, uh, this class is part of a church called St. Jude Oak Cliff. If you live in the Dallas area or anywhere around that, come check us out when we all gather again in person, but until then, jump on our YouTube channel that you're already on if you're watching this and check out our streams and all that for everyone else. It's good to see y'all and can you believe we are wrapping this up? So today's the last one and it's very fitting that I saved restoration for the end. So way of recap, we've had the seven essentials. They are the center of our faith. We must never let go of those things. Outside of that are really important things and they get less important the farther out they go. But these essentials are, are the things that really Christians have believed throughout generations. And it was really fun for you all that are part of St. Jude. If you tuned into our live stream this weekend or went back and listened to it, it was really sweet for me to lead us all in the creed. Again, the Apostles' Creed is just a reminder of this is what we believe. This is what's been handed down to us. And so today we are finishing it out and then we will hop on the Zoom on Tuesday night and I will get to learn from you all and what God has taught you all through through me and through this class and through the scriptures and through your own study. And so I'm looking forward to that greatly. So again, these are the seven that we've talked about. It's fitting that we saved restoration for the end because this is essentially the end times and what we believe about that. So as always, the goal of Christian instruction is worship. And so uh, go ahead and hit pause, take a minute to reflect on this question that I'm going to ask you. Also, I feel like I should just tell y'all, I went and I drove around yesterday in the sun and, um, I wore my hat backwards. Can y'all see where the hat was pulled back? And this is like super red right here. So if you're wondering, your eyes are not deceiving you. That And then my neck got burned. Anyways, I just felt like I needed to address the elephant in the room, which is my oddly shaped, weird red part of my forehead. Anyways, the goal of Christian instruction is worship. And so uh, if you listen to the service yesterday, Martin talked about there's a pattern in the scriptures and there's a pattern in life that... We often see and experience death, and because God is good, and because God is at work, and because God is the giver of life, then we often then see resurrection follow that. Death, resurrection, death, resurrection, uh, which will play into uh, what we're going to talk about today, of that we are not yet in the final kingdom, and so death is still something that we have to contend with. We fight against it. We, We declare it is evil. We don't make nice with it. But because God is good, we often see patterns of death and resurrection. So just like um, Lisa sent me a video yesterday of just blooming. I mean, we're in spring right now. And so you guys have probably seen this in your yards or wherever there's green, you might be seeing the reminder that though things go dormant and die in the winter, come spring, we have evidence, these beautiful bushes of flowers and things blooming that we see life. And so anyways, take a minute. Push pause, reflect on where you've seen death and resurrection in your life and maybe in this season around you, and how have you seen God in his mercies in this season, uh, though it has been a challenging and difficult one? Where have you seen signs of life in this season? All right, so hopefully you thought of great examples for that. So let's talk about restoration. So if you remember back in the atonement chapter, I talked about like what is mere penal substitutionary. Like if we were to boil down this restoration, this closed fist, we you have to believe in some sort of view of the restoration. What is What do we mean by that? Like what's that seminal truth, that tiny little truth that all Christians forever have believed? And this is really what it means, is that at at a very fundamental basic level, regardless, and we're going to talk about the different views of the end times coming up, mostly because it's what people care to talk about. I'll be honest with you, I think that is such a small part of of this understanding of restoration, but I'm going to give the people what they want. We'll talk about those views. But at the very basic level, we believe that we are headed somewhere, that what we have now is not as good as it's going to get, and we are going somewhere. Um, For Christians, time is linear. And what I mean by that is we don't believe in reincarnation. We don't believe that um, we're going to do this thing all over again. We believe that there was a beginning. We believe that God eternally existed prior to that beginning, that God, God is not linear, but the time that God has created for humanity is linear. So I should be clear about that. God exists outside of time and space and whatever. Like he enters into those spaces to interact with us, but we serve an eternal God. Okay. So God eternally, God existed three persons, one in essence. But at some point, God said, boom, or go, or whatever. From his mouth, he, he created creation. Okay. 
from that point, we have been moving linearly in time. We've got the Old Testament, and then we've got, you know, you've got creation, fall, flood, tower, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua. Like, like we can see the linear time through the scriptures, and the scriptures that we currently have point to there is a future coming. Like, we, we are all moving somewhere, okay? So at the very basic fundamental level, restoration says we're going somewhere, we're going to a new and better place, and we have great reason to hope. That is the Christian belief. Um, and this is how it plays out in the creeds, right? We say every Sunday, I believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life eternal. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life that is to come. That's what we mean by that. It's like we look forward to the day when those who have slept, fallen asleep in Christ, those who have died, will be resurrected and the, and the life that is to come. We are not there yet. We're headed somewhere. Okay, so I am beating a horse here. Most of you pretty much understand it. But what I'm trying to do is say like when we put restoration, that closed fist, None of these like pre-trib, post-trib, all millennial views that we're about to talk about, none of that is what I'm talking about. What is in that closed fist circle is this idea, Christ is coming back for us. He is coming back for us. We will get a new heaven and a new earth. We will live with Christ forever in eternity, and it is a better day coming for us. That is in the closed fist. The views of them, they go outside of that center circle. So you don't have to be a pre-millennial view of the end times in the like no that's wrong you can't put that in there you you can say though hey listen all of us christians agree we look forward to the life that is to come okay i'm beating a dead horse he's sufficiently dead so let's talk about the end times there there are basically four main views okay now there's nuance within all of these so with every time i do this i have to put like a little asterisk disclaimer I'm not going to be able to sufficiently do justice to every one of these views, and I'm just going to put my cards on the table and tell you right now. Those that fall in the dispensational millennial view, those that come out of DTS that are staunch believers in this, the camp that, frankly, I was bathed in most of my life, <laughs> they think this is very, I don't know, I shouldn't laugh, but they, anyways, it makes me laugh. It's fine. They think this is very, 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 very important, okay? Okay. And I guarantee you, for the staunch supporters of their end time view, I'm not going to do a good enough job explaining it. That is not my point. I'm trying to give you broad strokes today. So I'm going to give you broad strokes of the four main views. All of these views have nuance. All of them have scripture supporting them. They're all trying to make sense of, of the scriptures that talk about, they're all trying to make sense of where are we headed? What's it going to look like? How are we going to get there? Okay. So these four main views, you have uh, premillennialism, which all of these in, in the millennial kingdom, the millennial kingdom in Revelation 20, it talks about a thousand year reign of Christ, millennium, millennial, a thousand years, right? Y'all remember we start like celebrated like the new millennium in 2000. For those of you who are alive, my goodness, some of y'all might not have been born then. Anyways, for those of us who are old, we remember that, right? We remember when the clock hit 2000, it was like, it's a new millennium. It's a new thousand years. In Revelation 20, there is a passage that talks about there will be a thousand-year reign of Christ, that the enemy will be bound up, cast into whatever. That passage is kind of the mark of determining, like, what do you view about the end times? Is that thing literal? If it's true, when will it take place? Has it already taken place? That's where all these views come from. That's how we name them, okay? And, and what we're asking, essentially what people are saying is the premillennial views believe that there will be a rapture prior to that millennial reign, that Christ will return prior to the millennial reign, okay? Those, and there's two different views, and we're going to talk about the two different views, different kind of same ice cream, but different views. Then there's a post-millennial view that says Christ will return after the millennium reign, okay? So in the first one, pre-mill, what they're saying, they're shorting it. You'll always hear them say, I'm pre-mill, blah, blah, blah. What they're saying, they're answering the question, that thousand-year reign in Revelation 20, they believe Christ will return prior to that. Post-millennial say, no, 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 Christ will return after the thousand year reign and then all millennials if y'all know when you anytime you put the a in front of a word it's like a privative a it means it takes like like it takes it away um so like all millennial means like we don't we don't believe in a literal thousand year reign so they that's an, another view within pre-mill within pre-millennialism and that's why you'll hear me say pre-mill post-mill all mill because that's kind of how people shorthand them that's what they're referring to within the pre-millennial view there are two different types there's a more historic pre-mill view and then there's the dispensational, modern, pre-mill view. 
that dispensational one, that's heavily, you'll see it's heavily influenced by DTS and folks that come out of DTS, which is my tradition. It's where I went to school. It, this is what I, I will tell you'll see this as we un, as we unfold it so again the names have to do with that millennial reign when christ will come is is christ can come back before pre after post or is the millennial reign it's not literal so it doesn't christ will come back whenever he wants to so here's the different nuances of it first we're talking about the historic pre-millennial view lots of evangelicals love this view okay so wayne grudem craig bloomberg um ben witherington this view, both both the dispensational and the pre-mill view, it takes the Bible more literally than some of the other views. Now, even just saying that makes it feel like I'm I'm being controversial. A friend of mine, Jen Wilkin, she teaches up at the Village. She's written tons of Bible studies. She's a very gifted Bible scholar. Okay, she always says this is her phrase. So I'm gonna take. She goes, you don't read the Bible literally. You read the Bible literaturely. Let me see the nuance there. Not literally, literaturely. Okay. So what I mean by this though is different genres of literature. Like we know, like the way you read poetry today is not how you read a science textbook. And in our culture today, we tend to know the difference. Like if you started just reading, like if you just picked up a book off of my bookshelf and started reading it, there will be like markers that would like tune me in to know the kind of literature that you're most likely reading. And so then I would be like, oh, okay, so I'm supposed to take this very literal or this is more figurative or this is broad strokes. It's not meant to be minutia and all that. We have to do the thing, same thing when it comes to the Bible, okay? There's different literature in the Bible. We have Hebrew poetry in the Bible, which uses metaphor and hyperbole. And we know that sometimes we're not supposed to take it literally. We're supposed to take it like you do with poetry. Then we have historical books. But even within the historical books, ancient historical books have different have different rules than modern historical books. And so I'll give you an example. Um, in modern historical books, time for us is very literal. It, he started in the 1984 is when this began, boom, 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 blah, blah, blah. In ancient historical works, time is a little bit more loose. So you might say so-and-so began his reign during the time of blah, blah, blah. Well, that might be when he began his reign as co-ruler with his dad, or it might be when he began his reign on his own. It might be just, it was close to that year. Okay, so we sometimes take our modern rules and apply it to ancient scripture, okay? That's my long-winded way of saying. In the pre-mill views, when they look at apocalyptic genre, which is genre like Revelation and Daniel, those two books are where we get a lot of our views of the end time. For better or for worse, and I'm not making a judgment statement here, they tend to read those genres a little bit more literally. That even though they recognize that it's apocalyptic, they believe there's correlation between what was written and literal events. Okay? And so there may not always be a one-to-one -one ratio, though sometimes there are in their understanding, but they tend to say, like, if it says there's a thousand-year reign, then there is a thousand-year reign. It will be 1,000 years, not 997 not 1,052, 1,000 years, okay? Can y'all hear that? My um, my recycling is getting picked up, of course, right now at 320 on a Monday. Why wouldn't it be picked up right now? You know what? I'm grateful. I'm grateful because last week my neighbor parked his car in front of my trash cans unbeknownst to me and they didn't pick up my uh, recycling and so I haven't been able to put stuff in the recycling. I've had to take, anyways, so we're grateful. We're gonna take a little moment and say thank you, City of Dallas. Okay, we're going to press on. I think they're done. Nope, still banging. You know, these are just the problems with being in a pandemic. Okay, uh, so all that to say, th these views, both historic and the modern pre meal view, when they read the scriptures that talk about what things will be like, you will see there is a, uh, there is a tendency to read it a little bit more literally than some of the other views, for better or for worse. And again, you... I'm not saying but all of that is acceptable way to interpret the Bible for the most part, but that's where some of these different flavors will come in. Okay. So this is a timeline and I know this is kind of small, so you have to blow up your screen a little bit, but essentially the historic premillennial view goes like this. You have old Testament Israel. Okay. So that's that timeline happened. Then you see that cross in the, in far left of your timeline. That is where Christ of course comes in. Then you have the church age is ushered in after Christ. Now, 
the church has replaced Israel. In other words, the church is the new Israel, which is a little different than the other views. So the other views are going to say the church is the fulfillment of Israel, that true Israel always belonged to God, and the church is true Israel that belongs to God. The historic premillennial view would just say, listen, the blessings that were given to Israel are now given to the church because it has replaced it. Then there are passages in the scripture that talk about there will be a great tribulation to come. The historic premillennial view says that will start. So we're living in the church age. This is where we're at right now. There will be an event that kicks off the tribulation. Then you will have years of tribulation. And then Christians will be raptured up. They will be taken up into the sky and then Christ will return and then we will begin a literal thousand year view, thousand year reign on earth. At that time, the enemy, Satan, will be bound up, cast away so there will be no enemy. So, so Christ will come to this earth, the one we're on right now, and reign for 1,000 years. And then at the end of that, there will be judgment and those who are in Christ will be with Christ in the new heavens and the new earth. And those who are not in Christ will face the uh, will face the damnation that they are due, which is just, which is what the scriptures would say. Okay, so Old Testament, Jesus comes. We're living in the church age. We will face a time of tribulation, which will be telling all of us, "Ooh, get ready, get ready, it's coming." Then they will, then like Thessalonians says, in a twinkling of an eye, those who are in Christ will be taken up. And then at that same time, Christ will come down. He will establish his reign on earth. We will be with him on this earth. Christians will be with him on this earth. They will, there will be a literal thousand year period on this earth. And then that will be followed by judgment and then the eternal state that we're headed to. Okay. So that's the historic premillennial view. And again, Wayne Grudem, lots of evangelicals, they love this view. It's fairly popular view among evangelicals okay the, okay if i were teaching truly y'all if i were teaching this class in almost any other city in the in the world i don't even know that i would teach this view and i don't mean to be dismissive of my friends who hold this view it's just not that popular outside of the circles that have been um like uh, like really affected by dts now i say that and then I realized there are so many places that DTS grads have helped establish places like crew, places like BSF, things like that. So I realized that this view is very popular and has gone out. However, even DTS, where this view wasn't necessarily born, but it was really fostered, like that was the seminary where this view came in. Most of the professors today are starting to have a more nuanced view to this. That's why I'm saying I might not even teach it because I think that this view is starting to, I don't want to say die out, but it's starting to be reconsidered in light of some, some better tools of exegesis, okay? But that being said, DTS folks really love this view. It's going to sound very similar to the other premillennial view, the, the historic premillennial view, but it has its different nuances. Um, places like Canicuck, places like Watermark, places like um, Crew and other places, you'll see this view is very popular. And the other thing about this view is those who hold to this view tend to think this is really important. And they have um, an overemphasis, and I, I mean this as gently as I can say, like they're willing to die on some hills in this view that I think breaks up unity with the greater church. And I think that's unfortunate. And I don't know why, y'all. I seriously can't figure out why the end times view held by dispensationalists is such a big deal to them. I don't know if it's because they feel like they were code crackers and figured out some unique code to the end times. And again, I say, like, a lot of the people I'm referencing aren't even alive, okay? So I'm trying to be, gen I'm not trying to make fun of them. I, I promise y'all I'm not. But having, this is the view I was bathed in. This is the view I first learned. I was taught this is the only view. I was taught the other views don't take the Bible seriously. I was, and I have since, I do not hold to this view. Y'all, I've moved away from this view. Um, I like this view for one particular reason. I'll tell you whenever we, we get to it. But Part of the difficulty with this view is it makes a very clear distinction between Israel and the church. And what I mean by that is they would say that Israel had their time with God. Because Israel rejected their Messiah, that began the church age, which is the Gentiles age. Right now, there's parallel tracks that the church and Israel are running on, parallel tracks that they're running on. 
then Christ is going to rapture up his people. And then there's going to be a season of intense wooing of the Israelite people. And then Christ will return. And then there will be a thousand year reign. That is really hard pill for me to swallow. So if some of you are like, this is your view, listen, I get it. And I get it because when you read Romans 9, 10, and 11, it does seem as if the Israelites and the church are distinct. However, part of why I have a hard time with that view is the great links that Paul goes to in his writings to say that the dividing wall of hostility has been knocked down and Jew and Gentile are one family, okay? And so I think that... I think that the, the, the nuances of this view that separates Israel and, and, the, and Gentiles, which is all of us, is I don't know how I would support that outside of Romans 9 through 11. So that's my cards on the table. I know it's stronger than I normally come at these things. but um, And then I'll just tell you, people, again, I've said this before, people that hold this view tend to make a big deal about the end times. The trash can guy's back, you know, up one street, down the other. Uh, anyways, we're going to press on. And so... If you hold this view, here's what I just want to say to you as your pastor, or if I'm not your pastor, just as a fellow Christian friend, it is important to have doctrinal distinctions. It is important to hold your beliefs tightly. It's important to get into a healthy debate with other Christians about it. However, if the way you were taught this view was such that it doesn't allow you to have um, unity with people who disagree with that view or enough humility to say, I understand why some people maybe don't hold to this view, then I think you were taught it too dogmatically. And that that's what I should say about this. It's not that there's a problem with people have this view. The problem is, is some of the people who have championed this view have done so so staunchly and doggedly that it hasn't left room for people within this view to feel like other views might just be valid. And I think in all of these things where there's Christian charity, we should be able to have unity or at least go, hey, I heartedly disagree with you. However, we have a lot in common and hey, we disagree on that and that's okay. We can still break bread together. And if, you're, if you were taught that you can't break bread with people who don't hold this view, that is going a step too far. That's what I'm going to say about this. We're done. All right, moving on. So this view, it's going to look, again, like the historic pre-meal view. The difference being, though, is because there's a distinction between Gentile and Jew, you've got the Old Testament age, which was the Jewish time period, then Christ comes, and because the Jews reject Christ, now you're living in the church age. We are currently living in the church age. Then the rapture is going to come and take believers up to heaven. Okay, so up to heaven. Then there will be a seven-year period known as the tribulation that will be awful for folks. Okay, so seven years of terrible the first three and a half years is called the beginning of sorrows. You see that in the scriptures. Then in the middle of that three and a half years, the Antichrist will desecrate the Jewish temple, which will tell people like that event was predicted. Again, there's scripture for all of this that, that pe proponents of this view would say that's what that refers to. And then after that, you have another three and a half years. So there's years of tribulation, seven years of tribulation. And then Christ will return, bind up Satan, thousand year reign and then final judgment and eternal state so biggest difference between this view and the other pre-meal view is the other pre-meal view doesn't make a distinction between jew and gentile the other pre-meal view says no the church has replaced israel this one says no the church and israel are distinct the other view people are going to be here for the tribulation like christians will be here for the tribulation this view no you won't be here for the tribulation you'll be taken up to heaven seven years of chaos and it's not good and it's a and it's a the way they would word it is it's a last chance for repentance things will be really hard and when things are really hard people will use that to turn to god and then they they will do that so okay so i told you i would tell you the thing i love about this view here's what i love about this view is that if you believe that there will be tribulation, I like the fact that Christians will not be here. That's just, you know. That being said, I also think it's part of the weakness of this view. Um, Christians are often not spared from suffering. And in fact, we're called to take up our cross. So the thought of we, Christians would be gone during the tribulation when the world needs them most to declare that God is good and right. I mean, we're living in a literal pandemic. And right now the church has an opportunity to declare God is still good in the midst of chaos and brokenness. God is the God of resurrection, that though these deaths are here now, we know a God who can rise above death. And so, again, I 
like there are plenty of people that hold this view, hold the view if you want to. They, they will, they, and again, this is one of those views that takes things very literally. So in order to get this timeline, what they're doing is they're taking passages from Daniel and Revelation specifically. There's other passages, Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians. There are other passages that they reference, but they're going to say, this is what's happening. And um, specifically in Daniel, Daniel talks about there's 70 weeks and then the 70th week will be a week of tribulation. And so they call that 70th week. The week is really seven years. And so you can see where it, this is how they take the passage in their sort of coded language that they take and apply literally. Okay, so that's the, those are the millennial views. Okay, so pre-mill means you believe that Christ will come in some form prior to the millennial kingdom. In the, his, in the historic pre-mill view, there's years of tribulation, then Christ comes, then the millennial view, boom. In the dispensational view, Christ raptures up Christians. There's seven years of hell on earth without Christians here. Then Christ comes, then millennial reign, then eternal state. Okay, now we have post mill. So again, this means that Christ returns after the millennial kingdom. Uh, and so there'll be a thousand years and then Christ will return and begin the eternal state into where we're all headed. Some reformers really love this view. People like Jonathan Edwards, Peter Lightheart. Peter Lightheart's a contemporary. He's a guy that's alive today. B.B. Warfield, Charles Hodge. It really was at its height, though, at like uh, at the end of like the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. Okay, so anyways, I, all that to say, this is one of those views that like Peter Lightheart is an interesting proponent of it because he's alive today because a lot of the people that are proponents of it aren't really around. Um but there are people that this is their view. And so anyways, they post millennial views differ as to whether or not the reign of Christ is an actual thousand year period. Okay. And so this is one where they say, Hey, we think that there is a millennial view, whether or not it's actually a thousand years. We don't know because sometimes time and dates and the scriptures aren't exactly, they, they, they aren't exactly spot on. Um, but at its core, the distinctive post millennial thought is that the ever expanding progress of the gospel until the world becomes markedly Christian what this view says is we had the moment of resurrection then jesus ascends the holy spirit comes down and we've had the gospel going out suddenly and going out and going out and going out and in the beginning it was very difficult because they were under great persecution they were under great suffering but slowly but surely the gospel continued to spread into all the world and it kept going out this view believes christ like there will be more converts there will be a a golden age of christianity will continue to happen like it will keep spreading and then when we get to that point then that's that we're living in the millennial kingdom now the millennial kingdom is this ever-expanding presence of christians on the earth and then at when it ends christ will come back final judgment boom 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 it's um, it will be either we're already in it now is what some people hold to that view, or it will be ushered in by an unrelenting advance of the gospel. So like it boom, and then just whoosh, gospel goes out. People start believing. So that's the millennial kingdom is it's not like this. It's not necessarily Jesus comes to the earth and then it's ushered in, but instead the gospel is going out. God's people are going out. There's unbelievable missionary movement, all of that. Now, the interesting thing about this view is it does uh, find its popularity when mission movements begin in America. Um, and it does find its popularity in an unbelievable optimistic view of the world. And so, um, okay. I mean, you, so, uh, the, is the world becoming more Christian? Yes and no. Right. So are there countries, uh, that are starting to really see the advancement of Christianity in their countries and places that they never had it before? Yes. Are there places like Europe and America where the numbers were starting to see a trend downward? Yes. So how do you make sense of that? That's some of the weakness of this view. Um, I do. I like this view in the sense that I believe that uh, it's good to be optimistic about the power of the gospel, that it would go out and all that. It, I do think this view is dying out, though, just because people are kind of looking at the world and going, we don't really see that. And so I, anyways... If this is your view, kudos, great. I have, I'm not, art, whatever. I, I think this is a perfectly viable view. I, I agree. I do think that because this view is so nuanced, like whether or not we're currently in the millennial kingdom, whether or not still to come, that is going to have to be worked out among the people in this camp. Uh, but but yeah, it's, and again, this goes back to, are you taking the Bible literally or literaturely? This would be a group that would say, we're taking it 
literally like we believe in a thousand year kingdom but because it's apocalyptic genre literaturely it means we can kind of allow for some nuance of what that thousand year period actually like is it a thousand years is that just a way of saying a really long time um and so that's some of how they're trying to interpret that okay so yeah so here's our little thing you've got old testament israel You've got what uh, the ages 30 to 70 AD were kind of like the last times or like difficult days. You'll see like the, the Roman emperors were really hard on the Christians. 70 AD is this time of when um, Emperor Titus comes into Israel and he takes out the temple. Okay, he knocks over the temple, he destroys it burns it to the ground. So the temple is destroyed in 70 AD, which a lot of people say that that's what Jesus predicted. Like when he was talking to his disciples about you will have trials and tribulations. Some people think in Matthew 24, that's a reference to very future times, but post post tribulate or post millennial people would say, no, no, no. He's talking about like what's about to happen. Like that you, you all who are alive today are going to face very difficult days immediately after this. You have tribulation when the church is first born it's born out of tribulation it's born out of death and we see that in the book of acts right it's very difficult that's what the church is born out of and then you see a explosion of evangelization like an explosion of people coming to christ christ rules earth through the church is what the millennial kingdom is so it's not it's not christ is here it's that christ's reign has been unleashed and we will see fruit of that through the evangel through people coming to know christ through the good news being spread and then christ comes that's when we have judgment and then we enter into the eternal state great perfectly fine great moving on okay then the all mill view this is uh if they're honestly if you if you're gonna ask somebody like what's their view of the end times there's a good chance they'll either be all mill or one of the versions of pre mill. I don't know. Like I honestly, I'm going to ask you on Tuesday: Is anybody a post mill person, or they, did they grow up in that? Because I just I don't think that's as popular as this. All mill very popular. If you grew up in a Presbyterian church, this is most likely the view you grew up you grew up with. Um, same if you grew up in a Lutheran church or um, like some of them are high liturgical churches. This is their tradition. So. All millennial thinkers note rightly that the 1,000 year language describing the millennial period, rightly, that's funny. Okay, I copied this from someone who obviously believes uh, that the all millennial is view. So pretend that doesn't say rightly. All millennial thinkers note that they think rightly that the 1,000 year language describing the millennial period in Revelation 20 can be taken figuratively. Oh, no, no, that is accurate. Okay, yeah. yeah. They rightly note that it can be taken figuratively. Okay, so going back to literally or literaturely, apocalyptic genre is one of those genres in biblical studies that we're really beginning to understand better through other writings that we've discovered in the ancient times. So, whether, okay, so uh, I'm going to give you an example. If you haven't seen the movie Harriet, you got to go see the movie Harriet. The The lead actress in it is one, I think she only needs an Oscar. She needs something to get the EGOT, the Emmy, the Grammy, the Oscar, and the Tony. Like she is a phenomenal artist, unbelievable artist. One of the things they did in the movie that was really beautiful that a lot of folks who aren't familiar with either that time period or even Harriet Tubman's story is one of the things that there are old hymns that slaves would sing in order to while they were working and things like that and they were they were spirituals they sounded they were they were spiritual songs they meant to encourage them but they also also had coded language within them okay and those on the end like like the slaveholders of course didn't know it was coded language that was the point like they weren't supposed to know those who are slaves and those on the underground railroad those who participate in the underground railroad to help rightly free the slaves from the south they knew though that those songs so they would often sing those songs in order to communicate to folks when it was time to run when it was time to leave and all of that so that being said those spirituals that is a coded language that you can take literally and say yes it is a praise to god it is literally that but it is also figuratively something else completely as well apocalyptic genre is like that in the sense that those on the inside, those that John is writing to, the early church in receiving this would no doubt have understood what he meant better than us because we didn't get it. And chances are those outside of the Christian church may not have understood what John was saying entirely either when he wrote Revelation or for Daniel and all that. So the question is, 
how do you interpret apocalyptic genre that is its own category from an ancient world? Because the way that we write apocalyptic genre isn't going to necessarily be the way that they wrote apocalyptic genre. So all millennials, those in the reformed camp go, listen, we get that John wrote about a millennial reign. We just think it was figurative. We don't, we're not saying we don't take the Bible literally. We just think that coded language meant something else. So we don't interpret every, everything in the book of Revelation as a one for one. Like you'll, like in the Revelation, I'll talk about, there'll be bowls poured out and seals open and all that stuff. Those in the dispensational view believe those are literal things that are going to happen in the end times. Whereas those in the Amil camp go, no, no, no. It just means things are going to be bad. Like it, it just means like, it's going to be difficult. Okay. And so they are rightly saying they have, it is not wrong to say that's just figurative. There's not a literal millennial kingdom. Okay. You, that is a appropriate way to approach the scriptures and say, I'm trying to interpret this in its own genre as best I can. So the thousand year period isn't a specific thousand year cycle on an actual calendar. Instead, with his resurrection and ascension, Christ began his reign. This is what all millennial people say. You're looking for the kingdom of God. You want a timeline? Go look at his death and resurrection. Boom. That's when Christ began his reign on earth. He presently rules on earth, which is the millennial age. He is currently ruling right now. So this is more of a millennial age. It's not that there's a literal thousand year period. We are living in Christ's reign. The thousand years most likely just references a long time. Christ will reign for a long time, thousand years, that's a long time. Uh, and then through his people on earth, and then he will return physically whenever he wants, and he will usher in a new heaven and a new earth. Okay. So the all millennial view simplifies a lot of what's going on in revelation by saying that's, that is apocalyptic literature that is saying it's crazy. The kind of cosmic battle going on between, between God and his enemy, but Jesus is on his throne. He has been on his throne. And if you're worried about the end times, don't worry. Jesus is already on his throne. He will destroy the powers that wage war against his people now. Um, so again, like I said, reformers love this view. Martin Luther, John Calvin, R.C. Sproul, C.S. Lewis. Hey boo, C.S. Lewis. Anything C.S. Lewis believes you should just believe. Kidding, kidding. I don't believe everything he believes, but okay. And so they're honestly, their timeline's super simple. Christ came, he rose again, he began what we call the, pre the present age. We're in the millennium now. We like, it's just now, like it's not a literal thousand years. We're just there now. And then Christ will come back whenever he so chooses. And then we will begin the eternal state. So in terms of a timeline, this is the most simple view. Okay. So just to give you a side-by-side -side comparison, you've got the historical premillennial view. We're in the church age now. We will then face a tribulation. Things are going to get worse before they get better. Then Christ comes and then, you know, he will, he will start his literal thousand year reign here on earth. And then boom, new heavens, new earth. All millennial says, no, nope, Christ's reign is here now. You are going to consistently see death and resurrection until the final time when Jesus comes. So in this present age, like this is, the kingdom is here now. You should do kingdom work now. This is this is it. There's no different age to come. We're just waiting for Jesus to return. The post-millennial view says, hey, we're in the millennial kingdom now, and we should expect to see people coming to know Christ. Things are going to get better, infinitely better, because the gospel is going to go out, and then Jesus is going to come back, and then we're going to do that. Then the modern premillennial view or the dispensational view is like, hey, we're in the church age now. Things are going to get bad, but don't worry when they're about to get really, really, really bad. The tribulation, believers will be plucked out. There will be seven years of hell on earth. Jesus will come back. Thousand year period begins. And then a new heavens, new earth. Okay. So first view, the historic pre-mill view. Things are going to get worse before they get better. Then Jesus comes. The amillennial view. We live in a broken world. And we live in it and we, and we have to deal with that. But it doesn't mean that we're excused from making heaven on earth, trying to bring heaven here. We have kingdom work to worry about. Post-millennial view, we should expect that the gospel has the power to save and we should see it go out even in the midst of trial and tribulations. Modern premillennial view, you should expect things are going to get worse. But before it gets really, really bad, we will be taken out of here and then things will be better. Okay. I hope that was fun for y'all. Wasn't that fun for me? All right. Uh, I'm just kidding. I love teaching. Uh, okay. So helpful thoughts to consider. Because if you're sitting here and you're like, okay, for, like, I'm going to guess some of y'all are like, I've never heard this before. Or I heard it, 
But I heard it in such a way that, frankly, Nika, I don't think those other views have any, can't hold water. Or that's silly that anyone else will hold those views. Maybe you're somewhere in that mix, right? Okay, so let me, this is what I would do is just kind of some helpful thoughts to consider. Because, again, the closed fist essential of the faith is not that you hold to one of those views. It's not. It's that you believe that we're headed somewhere and for a better day and that Christ is coming back for us. Christ is coming back for us. The gospel story is this. There's creation, there's fall, there's redemption, there's restoration. That's it. Like that in the simplest form, like we be, there was first nothing, then there was something because God in his goodness created the world. And then we broke it. And then God created a redemption plan for us. And he's like, hey, I'm going to come back for you. We're going to make all things right. That That's the closed fist. We're going to make all things right in the end. So regardless of which nuanced end times view you have, and maybe you're going to be like, I'm not going to adopt any of them. I'm just going to hold on to the bare essentials. Kudos to you. Love it. Great. But here's what I want you guys to think through. Maybe a good rubric. Um, They all agree that we're headed somewhere better than what we've got. Okay. So even the post-millennial view, who's like, things are pretty good now, and they can keep getting better with the advancement of the gospel. None of them say, hey, like, Part of why people got really upset with Joel Osteen's book, Live Your Best Life Now, is because they literally had an eschatological problem with it, which means an end times problem with it, because people are like, you can't live your best life now. Your best life is always the one to come in heaven. Now, I never read his book. I have no idea. I don't, I don't know if that title is like what was in the book. Like, I don't, like, I'm just saying that's what some people got upset about is because all Christians agree our best lives are to come. We live in a broken world. We live in a broken cosmos. We feel aches and pains. Our bodies hurt. Relationships break. We have tears. Sometimes we cry and we don't even know why, okay? There is a better day to come. The good news of the Christian faith is not only that there is salvation for you here and now, and it is. That is good news. But there will also be ultimate victory, and that's what all of the views agree on. And so regardless of whatever nuanced view you have, what we hold tightly to in unity is, Our best days are to come. And that's good news. That is good news that we don't have to be here forever. Second thing, eschatology determines ethics, which is a phrase Martin and I use. We talk about often. Eschatology is just a fancy word. Eschatos is like end, in things, ology, study of. So eschatology is the study of end things or end times. How you think this world is going to go determines the ethics and how you live. And this is what I mean by that. If you believe that this world is going to hell in a handbasket, which is typically the pre-meal view, then when you see injustice in this world, you might be tempted to just say, that's just the way it is. Hold on, because a better day is to come. Now, that's an, that is a broad stroke summary of those who hold that view, because there's plenty of people that hold to a pre-meal view who, when they see injustice, say no, you should work towards justice. But if there is a weakness in the pre-mill view, it's that because they believe that this world is going to hell in a handbasket, then when there is systemic injustice, they say that's a sign of the times rather than a kingdom that has been unleashed in Christ should work to eradicate that, okay? So here's what I'm saying. I'm not saying you, ha- you pre-mill people can't care about injustice. I'm saying sometimes they don't because of their end times views. So here's what I'm going to say. Regardless, if you're pre-mill, post-mill, all-mill, two-mill, dose-mill, whatever-mill, no-mill, whatever, I don't care what your end times views are. You should believe, regardless of what your end times views are, that the kingdom of God was unleashed in Christ and that there's a king and a kingdom ethic and in and, and a, and a kingdom that we belong to, there's a king, a kingdom, and a kingdom ethic, okay? If there's a king, and all these views believe there's one, then there is a kingdom, which means all believers belong to a world that is not of this world, and there's an ethic, which means we care about justice and goodness and beauty and life and love and all that stuff. So this pandemic is actually a great case study in that. What are the things that are going to last and what are the things that are going to get burned up? If your view of this world is just like, well, a pandemic's a sign of the end times, so be it. You might be tempted to say, we just need to ride this out. If you are all mill, you might be going, no, no, no. There's ups and downs through all of God's kingdom and God's people need to make sure that they pursue justice and goodness no matter what. Whatever view you have, just make sure You are a person that is consistent in caring about the kingdom ethic of God. 
That's what I'd say. So whatever view you have, however you think this is going to play out, if your end times view makes you not care about the vulnerable, you have a bad end times view. Now, none of these should make you that way, but that is one of the complaints of the pre-meal view is they tend to just go, well, it's just a broken world and we're just, you know, hang on, it'll get better. And I'm like, well, hang on, but also gla- grab a tool and get the hammer in. Like, let's make this place better. Um, regardless of what your end times view is, they all assume some level of suffering now. Now the post mill view is a little bit more optimistic and that I'm laughing only because we're in a pandemic. Like if I had filmed this five months ago, I doubt I would be laughing because I'd be like, yeah, it's reasonable. Like you're seeing the gospel go out into the world. But I think because we're in a pandemic and I, I think some people would have a harder time with such an optimistic view right now for better or for worse. But that being said, all of them, even if you're in a very positive post mill view, we all agree there's suffering now. Okay. And, and so this suffering that we're a part of now is not evidence that God's plan to come and restore God's plan to come and return is off track or off course or out of time or whatever. No, that closed fist view of the restoration is such that there will be a time when Christ returns. And until then we will have to deal with suffering and it sucks and it sucks. Okay, but it, but this suffering now is not evidence that somehow God's timeline has been thrown off track. No, God is still on his throne. His kingdom is still here and he is still planning to come and take us home. Uh, the next one, Christ is coming back for us, period. He is coming to get his bride. Whichever view you believe in, whether you think we have to go through a thousand year reign, whether there is no reign, whatever you, I don't care what your view is, it is, it has to include that he's coming back for us, that he went away to prepare a place for us and that he wants us to come home and that he will bring heaven to earth and Christ will make all things new and we will be restored to fullness of relationship with the Trinity as well as with each other, those of us who call on the name of the Lord as Christians and that is the view of restoration. And so these views that can sometimes create a lot of like, in in fighting among christians like let's back up and all go guys we're all gonna we're gonna be together with christ in the end he's gonna come and get his bride and that is awesome like that is good news that's the stuff that you gotta take away from this restoration like oh we get to go home we get to go home and that's awesome and not only do we get to go home but we get to go home because we're ushered there by the the truest lover of our soul, the one whose image we bear. Lastly, you get to be you forever in the Christian view. And I think that's really good news. And so I, I went to Zen seminary and there was a guy who, um, he lives in Colorado. And so his, he lives in a, a part of Colorado. It's not super Christian. And so when he evangelizes, he really, um, Like sometimes like if you live in a more Christian part of the world, you can kind of be a little bit more direct in your evangelism. And then sometimes you kind of have to kind of, and so like one of the things he said is like he'll he'll sit in a bar, grab a drink or whatever with folks and he'll be like, hey, do you like you? And pastorally, that's a really hard question because I'll be honest with you, a lot of people don't like themselves. Um, And so he said, depending on the response, like if people are like, yeah, I like me, I'm, I'm great. And he's like, yeah, you know who else likes you? God, God likes you. And he's like, you know how I know? Like how? And he's like, because in God's plan, you get to be you forever. Like God so likes you, you have no ending. Like you will never end. And that means that when God created you, he loved you so much that he's like, you, Bob, you get to be Bob forever. And if you call on the name of the Lord, you get to be Bob with God forever, in eternity, in paradise, being you. That being said, pastorally, I was like, when I heard him say that, I was like, "Mm, there are a lot of people who aren't like Bob. And there are probably a lot of people who'd go, no, I don't like me. And so the idea of being me forever sounds awful. And that's where pastorally, we get to come alongside people and go, but what if there's a version of you that likes you? What if there's a version of you that can see yourself through the eyes of God? A version of you that says, I want to see what God sees because what God sees is a life worth keeping forever, is a life worth having for all of eternity, a life worth dying on the cross to save, a life that he says, you are so precious, Susan, Mary, 
whoever, I use women's names because women have a hard time liking themselves, but I know men do too. So Jim, James, whoever. God likes you so much that he wants you to be you. And not only that, he wants you to be the best version of you. So part of salvation in Christianity is not only do you get to be you forever, but the version of you is the best possible version of you for all of eternity. And that is good news. There are faith systems that say you just end. And then there are faith systems that say you get to come back as something else. And though I'm sure those in those faith systems see those things as good news, I'm telling you, I like me. And I want to be me forever. I think Nike is pretty great, problematically so. I'm on the other side of that. I'm like, I like me. Of course I like me. But like, I, but by the grace of God, there's a sanctified part of me that likes me because I am made in the image of God. Like, I, wa- I don't want to be someone else. Like, I don't want to be someone else. And I don't want to end. I, I love people. And I want to be with them forever. Like, I love my nieces and nephew. And the thought of saying there's a day coming when I will not know them or know myself is tragic to me. But if there's a hope in God that says not only does Nike get to be Nike forever, but Jaden and Nixon and Ainsley get to be themselves forever. And by the grace of God, he will capture their hearts and he will light them aflame. And I will always know them. Always. I will get to love my nieces and nephew with an eternal love in Christ. That is good news. That is good news. And so oftentimes I think as Christians, we think of good news as like what Christ did on the cross. And that is, that's the best news. But the reverberations of what Christ did on the cross, they move all the way into eternity. Because Christ conquered death, I then have a way to get to be me forever in eternal bliss with the God who created and fashioned me. And I can't wait to meet the future me, right? Like I like me now. That's a miracle in and of itself. But like there's a version of me to come that won't have insecurities, that won't lose her patience, that uh, won't have a need for control, that won't sit in pride, that um, doesn't fear abandonment, that... um, whatever like whatever your like there's a version of you that won't desire alcohol or substances more than God like there's a version of you that will be able to forgive the people that hurt you there's a version of you coming there's a version of you coming that will actually love God more than anything else there's a version of you coming that will be able to move past the trauma of your life because God will make it new there's a version of you coming that will behold the beauty of God and sit with him all the days of your life and never cease to worship the one in whose image you bear. That is good news. That's where we're headed. And I want a piece of that. And I want you to have a piece of that. And so regardless, if you're pre-mill, post-mill, all-mill, you know, post-mill, oak-mill, whatever, you get to be you forever. And you get to be you, a version of you, the better sanctified and glorified version of you that can sit with God and like who you are, know who you are, and be who you are. And that is a great gift to all of us that God gives to us. So where are we going? I thought it would just be fitting that we would read a couple of verses from the scriptures that tell us where we're headed. Um, Revelation is, again, an apocalyptic piece of literature, so sometimes we're like, is that literal? Is that literature? What is that? But these verses at the end, if you want to just encourage yourself um, in these dark days, I read Revelation 21 and 22, but I'm going to read just the beginning here of Revelation 1 um, and then a couple of other verses from the scriptures that talk about what it will be like. And so uh, that, it's just a fitting way to end this class, I think. So where are we going? Uh, this is from John's book of Revelation. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with us. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. 
and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, no crying, no pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, write this down for them so that they can know for these words are trustworthy and true. From Isaiah chapter 65, verse 25, it says, the wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. The earth and all of its inhabitants will no longer be warring. In Psalm 37, 29, excuse me, it says, The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. And then Isaiah 2, 4, it says, He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Where we're going is a place where love is a person. That we will see God face to face. We will see the Trinity. We will dwell in the land forever. We will be able to have pet lions and, and tigers and bears. We won't need swords or guns or shields, or those traumatizing school drills where kids have to get down and practice active shooter drills. We will not have those anymore. We will, as women, get to walk the streets at night not fearing what happens to us. Men, you will be restored to who it is that you are always meant to be. We will not fear rejection. We will not fear trauma. We will not fear war. We will not fear famine. We will not fear COVID. Where we are going is a place of total peace and beauty and goodness and truth and love. And we will dwell there all the days of our life. And the reason why is because we have a God who loves us. He loves us and he wants us to come home. He wants us to come to the home that we were always supposed to be a part of. So in that closed fist circle of restoration is good news. Christ is coming back for us and where we're headed to is a place that's almost unfathomable. In the meantime, your views on eschatology can determine how you behave. And here's what I would just say. God cares about the weak and the vulnerable among us. Whatever your end times view is, make sure you care about those things too. And whatever your view of the end times is should give you great hope that what we have now will be made new and made right. The hurts, the hangups, the pain, those will be glorified as well. Those will be made new. Those will be transformed. And we get to be us forever. Like I'll be hanging with y'all in heaven forever. Forever, forever and ever and ever. And we can't even begin to wrap our brains around that. And that is good news. And that is a fitting way to end an essentials class. Is on a very high note. So, if nobody's told you today that they love you, I do, but way more importantly, God does. And I am looking forward to seeing you all on Tuesday where we can uh, learn from each other and what we've all learned in this class. Peace and grace, folks.